Martyrs' Day is a, uh, a day every year in which the Iraqi honor their war dead, uh, which is a fairly large population uh, in Iraq since they've been engaged in one war or another ever since uh, the Ba'ath Party took, uh, took office. And on that day, by decree of uh, the state, uh, there is a ceremony held in Iraq uh, at the Martyrs' Monument, at which uh, war widows and, and war orphans and various other people go to have the official ceremony honoring the dead. And I went to it um, the, on the Martyrs' Day after the end of the Gulf War uh, and attended the ceremony as a reporter. And uh, it struck me at the time as a, a wonderfully emblematic moment uh, about Iraqi society, about the, the wretchedness that Iraq was, uh, about the, uh, the wretchedness of the lives of the people there. This is this, uh, what is supposed to be a great day of national emotion. And the, but it is really something t utterly machined by the, uh, the state, by the Ba'ath Party. So that the people trooping up to pay their respects to the dead with their banners and their bouquets of flowers are one after another uh, party hacks or bureaucrats or military officers. They are functionaries of the state, every single one of them. And I had a, a minder uh, with me, a, a gentleman from the Ministry of Information and Culture who was assigned to watch over me. And at, at one point he, uh, he saw, he was, he was whispering in my ear what each deputation is. You know, this is the Iraqi Students Association, this is the Iraqi Doctors Association, all of which are party organizations. And at one point, he saw a deputation come up and he got excited. He said, why, they have no banner. Perhaps this is just ordinary citizens. And then the wind shifted and it blew over a banner and he said, oh, no, it, it is the Ministry of the Interior after all. And uh, I thought, you know, this is... To me, that was a, a moment, and I, I wrote the first chapter of the book uh, about that, a, a small chapter, just to sort of set the tone. I took the title from that. I went to, uh, I went to Iraq uh, the first time, to Baghdad, about a week before the war began, and stayed through the first uh, night and day of bombing uh, that, that was the opening of the war in Baghdad, and then left to go to Amman, and then uh, from Amman on to uh, Tel Aviv and uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, to Kuwait and Iraq for the ground war, uh, to Kurdistan for the uh, Kurdish rebellion and it's in the flight of the Kurds, and then back to, finally back to Baghdad the last time, about a year after the war ended, uh, for my last trip. So it, it, most of my traveling was over a period of about a year from just before the war began to about a year after it ended. In those days, I was uh, working for myself, which is a, a nice uh, state for a writer to be in. Uh, and uh, I suppose the reason I was able to see all that I, uh, I was able to see, because I didn't have any bosses telling me to come home or to leave a place. Uh, and I was uh, str stringing for the Boston Globe uh, and writing magazine articles for the New Republic and for Gentlemen's Quarterly. I uh, came close, I suppose, to... Uh, uh, to something along those lines a couple of times. I'd, I th uh, found the first night and day in Baghdad with the bombing uh, frightening, uh, but I don't suppose that I really was in any danger. I mean, uh, I'd, I was underground in a bomb shelter much of the time, and when I was outside during the, the day, I'd, I'd, nothing fell near me. Um, and the bombing was remarkably accurate. Um, most of it was, uh, uh, most of the rest of the time, even going through the ground war, uh, traveling with a reporter a friend of mine, Dan Festerman, at the Baltimore Sun, was, was not too dangerous. Uh, the only thing I suppose that was dangerous was uh, going back into Kurdistan at the end. I, got, uh, I was traveling alone in the uh, Kurdish-held part in the north of the country, uh, which was uh, illegal, uh, of course, and um, I got dysentery then. and uh, it proved to be such a fast illness and so debilitating that I uh, got very sick and couldn't move much. Uh, couldn't keep on walking and hitchhiking to get out. And uh, For a few days there, I was uh, scared. I found uh, somebody, some rebel uh, Kurdish uh, Peshmerga troops took me to the, uh, a mountaintop headquarters of uh, Jalal Talabani, who was one of the Kurdish, is still one of the two primary Kurdish uh, leaders. And uh, being a big shot, he had a doctor, uh, and his doctor had uh, 
a little bit of uh, antibiotics, not enough to get rid of the sickness, but enough to sort of cripple it. And uh, eventually, uh, nine or ten days later, I was able to get out of, uh, sort of kept walking and hitchhiking rides uh, to the Turkish border and uh, was able to cross the river there and into Turkey where I could get, uh, get to see a, uh, a real doctor. No, he was a real doctor, I guess, in Iraq, but a doctor who had supplies. Max is uh, my wife, uh, Madeline, and she was uh, in the war at the same time I was, uh, which uh, made it a, a kind of a nervous-making experience for both of us because I was in the Arab world and she was in the Israeli world, which, as you know, there's almost, it's very hard to communicate between the two. Um, she was in Tel Aviv as a producer for CBS News during all of the Scud attacks, uh, when, at the times when I was in Baghdad or Amman. We would keep in touch via New York. Uh, telephone calls from Amman to New York to Tel Aviv and so on, which is a sort of routine dodge that everyone does over there. We did uh, for her birthday in Tel Aviv, uh, and uh, a night on which, happily enough, there was a no scout attack, and uh, instead we went to a very good party. Now I'm a White House correspondent for the New York Times. I suppose it did when I, I had written a number of... Uh, a, a bunch of stories for the New Republic, and those were uh, pretty well uh, received. And when I got back uh, to the States uh, at the end of the war and was busy writing the book, uh, Howell Raines, who was then the Washington bureau chief, uh, asked me to uh, come in for a talk, and he and I talked, and that led to a job. I wanted, I, I didn't know at the beginning uh, that I had any mission. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a very organized uh, person, and I started it out almost by accident. I, I wanted to, to go to Baghdad and see the beginning of the war and write something about it. Uh, I had no uh, larger thought in mind. Um, but once I started it, I got more and more, I suppose, uh, impressed by what seemed to me a great difference between uh, the texture of what you could see uh, on the ground, the, the way that uh, war, this war or, or any war, um, the remarkable things that happen in a war, the, the things that happen to people and the uh, astonishing displays of emotion, cowardice and bravery and uh, terror uh, that you see all around you at all the time. So I got impressed between the difference between what I was seeing there and what it seemed to me uh, the war was being uh, presented as not by any conscious design, but I, I suppose just by an accident of circumstances, in an almost euphemistic way, as a rather bland, uh, antiseptic uh, event, uh, that the, the public face of it was often uh, a reporter standing in, in uh, outside a briefing room or reporters asking questions in a, in a briefing room or something. And I thought that much more was happening, uh, that there should be that while television had fulfilled this extraordinary role in the war of making it the first war in video time, the first war that video cameras could actually capture and put out on satellites, that there sh should be a place for a writer to, uh, to pay attention to the very small details and uh, work at carefully describing the, the things that actually happened to individual unimportant people in a time of war. Uh, because I think that's a, an astonishing uh, time. You see things that you don't see at other times. I saw uh, one of the things that struck me uh, during it. Um, I was watching uh, one day in Kuwait City this uh, young man standing in front of a television crew in, in, a, in an abandoned theater, uh, in Ku a concert hall, really, in Kuwait City. And the television crew had bought him to that spot because it was the spot where he had been tortured by the Iraqis. And they wanted uh, him to stand in front of the, of the place where the torture rack had been and recount the, the tale of his own torture, which, astonishingly enough, he, he was willing to do. And while he was doing it, and the video camera was capturing this, he was uh, silently crying, and the tears were streaming down his face as he talked of his own torture. And, and the producer gave, whispered instructions uh, to the cameraman to get the right sort of shot and everything. And I thought, uh, that's an astonishing scene, to see something like that. And the only way you can, can capture that is by writing about it at, uh, later at a remove and trying to get it down just so. Uh, 
You see in, in normal life almost nothing like that. You, you might see in the course of a lifetime two or three people cry. In a war, you, I probably saw 30 or 40 people cry. People cry all the time. It's a routine event. You walk down the street and you see somebody crying. You don't even know why. And I thought a writer might be able to put some of that down on paper. Uh, from my father. Uh, my father is a newspaper man and, uh, I, and a lovely writer. And I started studying his style when I was very young, six or seven, I suppose. Tom Kelly. He writes now for the Washington Times, and he's uh, working about two-thirds of the way finished his first novel, a mystery novel set here in Washington in the Great Depression. Born in uh, Washington, grew up in Fourth and Constitution. Um, I have uh, quit a lot of jobs at one time or another um, to try different things. I started out in television in New York, uh, working for Good Morning America as a booker. Uh, and. I quit that to become a newspaper reporter in Cincinnati and I quit that to become a newspaper reporter in Baltimore and then in Washington and uh, eventually quit that to become a freelancer um, because uh, Max uh, had gotten a job in Chicago and I wanted to follow her. So I went to Chicago to freelance and that's where I started writing magazine pieces and, and, and longer writing. She's here. I'm happy to say we're married. She's a producer for CBS News here in Washington. I suppose uh, the biggest impression on, on me, I suppose uh, some of the things I saw in and around Kuwait City, I had never seen uh, before, and I don't think uh, many people have seen what happens to a place that is occupied uh, by an army out of control. Uh, and much of, and this, this got to, to, to what I was talking about earlier, about the difference between the sort of euphemistic way in which we sometimes talk about things and the way they really are. The, what happened in Kuwait City uh, was so extraordinary. It, and to, to walk through it, to see the endless blocks of uh, gutted and looted and uh, savaged uh, buildings, and to go through the morgues and, and see the torture, you know, I spent one whole afternoon just in the morgue going from torture victim to torture victim. Uh, to, to talk to the people and uh, uh, to see, to hear their, their terror and so on. Uh, that made a great impression on me because I thought that, I thought then and I think now that there was some misunderstanding perhaps in this country about w why in a moral sense this war might be considered necessary or just. Uh, and I had my own doubts about that. Uh, before I went to Kuwait City. And after that, I never had any doubts about it again, that uh, when you see what actually happens to a people who uh, are taken by a hostile army and uh, by an army that is intent on a campaign of uh, looting and murder and, uh, and rape and so on, uh, it removes in a very clarifying way any confusion you might have had in your mind about whether it was a good or a bad idea to stop this sort of thing. In my mind, yes. I mean, in my mind, it was absolutely worth it. Uh, first of all, we paid a very small price. Um, the, the coin of war is death, and we paid almost nothing uh, in that coin. Um, in financial terms, I think the price was uh, quite bearable. In terms of what it netted this country, the obvious uh, things, the, the stopping of the threat to the oil supply, uh, the obvious economic reasons are enough, but it also, I think, sent an astonishing message about the United States uh, to the world that was worth a great deal. And that, uh, that message uh, is in keeping with the message uh, that is now being sent uh, in Somalia, the notion that a great power, the sole remaining great power, uh, might be willing to use massive force to stop something terrible from happening for reasons that are at least in part altruistic. In other words, for reasons at least in part because it is the necessary good thing to do. It is a tremendous thing to do. And it won us much more, I think, than we realize in the Middle East. When I went over for that first trip to Baghdad and Amman, the conventional wisdom in Amman uh, 
the writing in the newspapers, the talk among the intelligentsia, was all to the effect that the United States, who was obviously uh, in working in concert with Israel, was going to use this as an excuse to start a new program of colonization of the Middle East, that once American troops were in, they would never leave, that they would end up taking the riches uh, for themselves. And when the United States did not do this, when it did what it said it was going to do, to restore uh, Kuwait to the Kuwaitis and then to, to leave, uh, it went, I found when I went back to Amman a year later, uh, a very long way to changing the perceptions of at least some people people in the Arab world about the United States, to seeing the United States as not, not necessarily and completely evil, which is, has been the prevailing view for many years. My second, I had gone to Israel before, but never to the uh, Arab world. I had, um, I was uh, tremendously taken uh, with, with one great uh, difference between Israel before the war and, and the second time I went during the Scud attacks. And, when I went to Israel the, uh, the first time, uh, before the war began, it seemed to me a country in something of a funk. The Intifada had been going on, I think in, it was in its third year, I believe, uh, and it had recently escalated to knife attacks and uh, gun attacks as opposed to a merely stone throwing. Uh, the political debate was utterly polarized, uh, but with left and right and very few people left in the center having a voice. There was an awful lot of talk about depression and, uh, you know, a neurotic society and so on and so on. Uh, I went back uh, during the Scud attacks and found a country that was uh, living like London in the Blitz, uh, a country where merely being there, uh, staying in Tel Aviv during the war and not running away, uh, was an act of conspicuous bravery so that a person could become a hero uh, and that's a rare and difficult thing for a person to become, simply by getting up in the morning and going to work in Tel Aviv. And it, that did a wonderful thing for that uh, society. People were bursting with, uh, with joy at, uh, at being Israeli again, and at, uh, at the, to the Israelis' astonishing uh, fact that for the first time in the history of the Jews, another people was, uh, were, had proved itself willing to actually fight on behalf of Jews. Uh, when the Americans came in with the Patriots missiles, uh, to the Israelis that was astonishing. Uh, that uh, some, uh, that uh, a non-Jewish people would come in and say, yeah, we're, we're on your side, we'll fight, we'll fight for you and with you on this. Uh, it, it did an awful lot to the, to the national psyche, or for the national psyche. It must have been a wonderful time for them. I mean, I, um, I could only see, see it as, as an observer, um, but uh, they, were, they were the toast of Tel Aviv, which is a, a beach town and, a, and a, to some degree a party town, so it's a, a place that would naturally be fun for a young American serviceman to be. But in this case, I think it must have been wonderful. I mean, they couldn't walk down the street without uh, women coming up to kiss them and, uh, you know, men coming up to shake their hands, people would invite them home for dinner, uh, people would, uh, there were billboards all over the city thanking them, advertisements in the uh, newspapers thanking them every day. Cairo, uh, I found, uh, I suppose in an odd way, the most in intimidating place uh, I, I saw, just because it is so overwhelming. Uh, there are, I think, 12 million people in, in Cairo now, and uh, it is approaching society as a black hole. It, it's so dense that nothing can escape. Uh, and I was uh, only in Cairo for a matter of days trying to get from there to Saudi Arabia for the beginning of the ground war, but it, it was long enough. I, I thought, I liked Cairo, it was exciting, but it was, you know, it was like New York, but New York ratcheted up 10 degrees above even where New York is today. I mean, everything is noise, everything is chaos and confusion. They're wonderful. Uh, they were, of all the people I met in my travels, uh, uh, I suppose the people I liked uh, the most immediately. Uh, I traveled during the Gulf War. Uh, Dan Fasperman, a reporter for the Baltimore Sun, and I traveled with the Egyptian army. Uh, the American army at that time was uh, had all these elaborate rules about press participation and coverage. It, it seemed to me to make coverage uh, 
almost impossible, or at least not worth worth doing, really. Um, and uh, one of the rules was that if you weren't part of the pool system, they, they would actually arrest you and put you in a stockade for the night. The Egyptians didn't care at all. Dan and I just sort of wandered into an Egyptian army column on the uh, morning of the second day of the war and asked uh, a major if we could tag along. And he said, well, sure, why not? I mean, <laughs> it's a free desert. Uh, and th th that was our whole attitude towards, uh, you know, sure, why not? I take um, uh, an awful lot of notes. Um, I suppose I filled uh, 40 or 50 notebooks uh, during the actual war, and I, I write every night, in, or I try to write every night in the hotel room um, longer things, reflections and, and so on that I didn't fill in notes at the moment, but a lot of notes. I travel very heavy, um, which is a problem. I, uh, by the, I never know uh, how to underpack, and uh, by the end of the, my last trip, when I went to Kurdistan, one of the reasons it was so difficult getting out of uh, Kurdish Iraq uh, was that I had somehow gotten to the point where I was carrying three large pieces of luggage, and as somebody who didn't have a car, it's a sort of insanity. I, I know other travelers who have this problem, but I, I never throw anything away. I pack everything. I save local newspapers wherever I go, and I get heavier and heavier and heavier. Uh, and I end up, you know, with 150 pounds of stuff sort of dragging behind me. I uh, hired interpreters uh, as I went along uh, in each country, either for a week or for a day or something. But I'd, I went uh, every day with an interpreter. Uh, I don't speak Arabic. Uh, and you find an awful lot of people who speak English. Um, but you really should have, uh, you need to have an interpreter with you. Um, yes, I had to uh, pay for everything myself and get reimbursed. Uh, so I was sort of um, maxing out credit cards and uh, rolling the debt along and um, beseeching editors for uh, reimbursements to keep going. Um, not too bad. It depends on where you are, but anywhere. Uh, it depends on the market as driven by how many journalists, foreign journalists are in the country. But it could be anything from a few dollars a day to 150 bucks a day. Uh, it, again, it's all market. Uh, driven. I would uh, either fly in or drive in, and then once I was in the country, I would uh, it, it, sometimes I would I rented a car, a, a Nissan, a four-wheel drive kind of thing with Dan and I to uh, cover the ground war itself, so we could just drive through the desert. Um, through Iran and Iraq, I uh, I sort of half hitchhiked and half took taxis. In Iran, I took taxis. In Iraq, uh, in Kurdish Iraq, I mean, I mostly just hitchhiked from one rebel group to another. They would pass me along. In Baghdad, it's easy to travel. Uh, be, uh, there's tons of taxi cabs uh, there. You just take a cab. And you usually have a minder with you uh, in a government car sometimes, too. Yes, a couple times. Um, the, uh, I guess, no, more than a couple times. Fairly often, you'd run into something, where, but never in such a way that it was... Uh, a tr tremendous problem that I it was in a in trouble that I couldn't get out of because no one spoke English. It, usually there will be somebody at, in a position of authority if you get stopped by an army patrol or something, fairly low down on the level on, of authority, on the level of lieutenant or something, you'll find somebody who speaks English because everyone is taught uh, English in schools in every Arab country, I think. The um, Israel occupies this odd state in the in the Arab mind, it's a, at once a devil state and simultaneously it doesn't exist. Uh, so that there can be no official uh, intercourse between Israel and the Arab world. You can't place a phone call uh, from Amman to uh, Tel Aviv, even though the two cities are only uh, a few miles apart, really. Um, but because it's in everybody's interest to keep, to keep communication open for commerce and for other reasons. All sorts of elaborate dodges have been built into the system to allow people to actually, to act, to actually travel and to communicate. For instance, if you go to a travel, I went to a travel agency in Amman to get from Amman to uh, Jerusalem. Now you can't do that directly, but you can, f you can fly to Larnaca on Cyprus, which is a, just a hop of a flight, and then fly from there uh, to Tel Aviv and then drive to Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, everybody will work with you to make that possible, even though you're not really supposed, 
officially you're not supposed to be doing this, but the whole system works on everybody looking the other way. So, oh, I suppose it's about a uh, less than an hour, 50, 20 minutes or something. It's a half hour drive, 40 minute drive. Um, if you drove directly from Amman to Jerusalem, you could drive the whole thing in about, a, I think, two hours or something, um, crossing the Allenby Bridge. But you keep, everybody travels, everybody who routinely goes from, in, from the Israel, from Israel to the Arab world or vice versa, keeps two passports, one stamped uh, good for Israel and Egypt only, uh, since Egypt does allow uh, correspondence since Camp David with Israel, and the other for the rest of the world. So that when you go in to, if you go from Larnaca, for instance, to, uh, to Tel Aviv, when you enter Israel, you use your uh, Israel only passport. And when you exit Israel, on the other end, let's say to go as I went from uh, the border near the Gaza Strip to drive across the Sinai to Cairo, you use that again. But entering, entering on the other side of the line, the Egyptian Immigrations and Customs Building, you use your rest of world passport. Now the Egyptian customs officer knows that you came from somewhere. The, the last entry in your passport is uh, for entering uh, Larnaca. And there's a gap of time and he, he knows very well you've just crossed Israel. But everybody is committed to the notion of, of, of looking the other way if necessary. Uh, and the telephone system works that way too, that uh, the travel agent I work with in Amman to, to make that trip, for instance, she asked me if I needed a hotel room in Jerusalem. And I said, no, I, I was going to stay uh, with, with Max in Tel Aviv. But she said, well, if you did, it's easy for me to arrange. I said, well, how can you arrange that? And she said, oh, I have a cousin in Brooklyn. He has a fax machine. Uh, the phone is set up to autom the phone on the fax machine is auto automatically set up to forward the call to another cousin we have in Jerusalem. So I fax my cousin in Brooklyn. His phone f forwards the fax to Jerusalem. The cousin in Jerusalem reads the fax, makes you a hotel reservation. It takes two minutes. I drove uh, uh, from the border across the Sinai uh, to Cairo, and, and that took only a day. Uh, and then from Cairo, uh, hung around for a few days, beseeching the Saudis for a visa, and then went from Saudi Arabia to Bahrain to Dharan, arriving in Dharan about, uh, I suppose, two days before the beginning of the ground war. Mm -hmm. That is uh, actually a picture of the visa, the Iraqi visa, uh, from my passport. Uh, the, my editor uh, had to make a picture of that. I had uh, a wonderful editor, Sharon Delano at Random House, and the size of the book, the way the cover looks and so on, uh, all reflected her ideas of the way she thought it should look. And I, uh, I thought it uh, was beautiful, actually, by the time it was finished, so I was very happy about it. Um, a few, uh, my, my mother and uh, a few other uh, people in my family uh, were sort of annoyed at me for not mentioning more at the time about how sick I'd been in Kurdistan and finding about, out about it in the book. I had not really mentioned it an awful lot. Um, a few people have, uh, have seen things in it that I, I didn't see when I wrote it. And I, I think it, to some degree, is a, is a book that people see in it what they want to see. A couple people have told me that they saw in it what my views were about uh, the Gulf War and so on, and which are not explicitly stated in the book. Uh, and I, it was interesting to me to find out that everybody sort of saw my views as, as, as what they wanted to see, that those who were against the Gulf War thought it was a needless war, that the United States had acted improperly. Some people who hold that view, uh, which is not mine, ha have told me that they can see that in my writing, and others who thought uh, that the Gulf War was a necessary war and that the United States prosecuted it uh, well, uh, have told me that they can see that in the writing. Uh, it's not that hard. You just uh, need to uh, fly to Bahrain and then you can drive over the causeway into Dharan, which is an oil pumping city that, if you remember, was the uh, was sort of a jumping off point for the ground war. Uh, in Dharan, uh, I, I did not want to take part in the pool system and uh, uh, wanted to go uh, out by myself or with a partner, uh, Dan. So we had to spend a day or two getting outfitted, uh, renting a, a four-wheel drive and scrounging around to get uh, 
some military clothes so we could sort of try to pass ourselves off as belonging there. Uh, we found that uh, the, uh, the Allied troops had, had painted inverted Vs on all of their vehicles as a, as a sign to, them, to themselves that that vehicle was proper and, and belonged uh, in the combat zone. And so we went to a, a Safeway or of some sort in Dharan and bought masking tape and colored it black with magic marker. I mean, a pathetic exercise and it wouldn't fool anybody. Um, but to my surprise, it got us through. I mean, we would get to checkpoints and there would be a military policeman there and they would see the inverted V and salute. And Dan and I looked less like soldiers and, uh, than anybody else. And, and we were always amazed at this work, but it, it did work uh, fairly well. We, got, we would get turned back at a few places, but by and large, we were able to wander around at will. The, I'm not sure if I remember the date exactly now. Uh, Nine, yeah, uh, was it the 21st, I think, of February, something like that. The first day of the ground war, or the... I, um, I was, I suppose, like everyone else, surprised that the, that the successful prosecution of the Gulf War bore such meager political fruit for George Bush. I would have thought, and I think most people would have thought, during that week in which we were watching the victory parades in New York and in Washington that there would be tremendous resonance uh, from this. And I don't really know why that there wasn't. I don't know if it's because we now live in such a, uh, an astonishingly fast-paced and, and sort of information overloaded society that nothing has resonance beyond a few weeks anymore. I mean, that, that seems to me one possibility. Everything uh, is utterly transient now in politics. Uh, you're a hero because of this, and, and a month later you're a, a goat because of some economic figures. Um, I think that a different politician, a, a better politician, somebody who was actually good at communicating as Bill Clinton is, could have made the resonance stick, could have gotten a good deal more uh, political mileage out of, out of the Gulf War. Uh, George Bush always struck me as having uh, an astonishing lack of ability to seize an emotional moment and make it his own. As, as Ronald Reagan always had this tremendous, Ronald Reagan could seize emotional moments that had nothing to do with him, that he had no claim on. That, for instance, uh, uh, going to uh, the beaches to, for the re remembrance of uh, the landing at Normandy. That, that is not anything that Ronald Reagan had anything to do with. But he, was, he, he knew how to use communications, to use uh, people like us and to use television to make that work for him. George Bush had, uh, all, had the opposite trait, that something would happen on his watch, uh, something of extraordinary power, such as the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall. And he would show no ability to take it and make that politically his own moment. R R Bill, R Bill Clinton or Ronald Reagan, if the Berlin Wall fell while they were president, would have been over at Checkpoint Charlie so fast and standing on the wall, you know, uh, right there in a perfect shot. Bush, I think, in a communications age, greatly suffers from not, from not having that ability. I didn't uh, cover any, I didn't spend any time with them. I spent no time uh, in any of the, w uh, with any of the official structure at all. I, I did spend some time talking to uh, American soldiers uh, and officers, but on a, fairly low level, uh, uh, people that I've found on the battlefield and, and in Kuwait City and places like that and, and just talked to, but I, I didn't have any real contact with the uh, officialdom. I don't think so. When I got to Duran, they asked me to sign some paper saying that I would be part of the pool system and it was, I, I tried to read it, it ran to three or four pages of dense type and it seemed to prohibit everything I could imagine uh, wanting to do. Uh, so I, I didn't sign it and uh, went and got some coffee instead. That's one of the great advantages of being a freelancer is that you uh, exist outside uh, uh, the rules that the grown-ups make. I mean, the pool system was a compact between the military and the American news organization so that anybody who worked for a news organization as a staffer, and I had friends who suffered greatly from this, who were felt tremendously frustrated in their ability to get out and cover the war, any, but anybody in their position uh, was, was part of that compact.
a New York Times reporter would be part of that compact, or a Washington Post reporter, or a Boston Globe reporter, or anybody. Yeah, I carry a, a little Radio Shack or something like that. I, um, I suppose that I think uh, a lot about the, the ability you have in writing a book, uh, something of that length and something with, without, without the conventions of journalism to bind it, uh, the ability you have to, to tell a story uh, in, in detail and to use the accrual of detail to paint pictures. Uh, I think if I miss anything in newspaper writing, it's that. It's difficult to do that in newspaper writing uh, because of the limitations of time and space and because of the conventions of, of newspaper writing. Uh, physically, uh, I was sort of, Dan and I were uh, wandering somewhat lost uh, through the uh, desert looking for an army. Um, a little embarrassed, I, at least I was, because we had been looking at that point for an army for um, many hours. It took us, we couldn't find the war at first, uh, and, which is a, uh, mildly humiliating. I mean, to, to go out and, and be prepared and have your fake inverted V on your car and everything, and to not be able to find uh, the largest ground battle uh, in history. Uh, but we, we did find it eventually, and, and I suppose by accident, I, as I remember, we were just driving along and we ran into uh, all of a sudden, a very large group of uh, men with guns and tanks, and um, we were we knew right away that that was an army. They were great, yes, somewhat. Um, they uh, they let us come along with them. They let us uh, watch them do whatever they were doing. We didn't get to see much in the way of fighting uh, because there wasn't much in the way of fighting uh, in the ground war. A, a testimony, I I think, to the extraordinary job in which which the Allied forces and the American military did in waging the war. Uh, they, uh, they had so overwhelmed the Iraqis who are, I think, except for the Republican Guard, at best a reluctant enemy. The average Iraqi private was not at all interested in dying for Saddam Hussein in the trenches. Uh, that by the time when the ground war began, it, it would be unfair to say that there was no fighting because it, it would suggest that the soldiers didn't have a job to do, which is, is wrong. They did, and they, I think they did it extraordinarily well. But there was an awful lot more surrendering uh, than there was fighting. Most Iraqis gave up as soon as they could, and to anyone they could give up to. That would have been the second, I guess, day of the ground war, and, or the third. And Dan and I were trying to get to Kuwait City. Uh, because it was clear that the war was, for all practical purposes, over. And we wanted, uh, it, if you remember, it only lasted 100 hours. We wanted to get to Kuwait City uh, for the liberation. Um, we, were dr we were trying to make our way up a highway that ran inside Iraq, ultimately to Kuwait City, and picking our way through it uh, slowly because the Iraqis had uh, set dynamite charges in places across the roads uh, to to stop you from going forward and because there were minefields all around and not all of them were marked and you had to sort of watch your step uh, and we it was dusk and it was raining and it was miserable and uh, we came suddenly upon a group of uh, wretched looking uh, men uh, holding waving a standing in the middle of the road waving a, a white flag uh, a t-shirt on a piece of bamboo I think and uh, they were clearly Iraqis, and they were unarmed, and they were, uh, uh, they cut a pathetic sight. I mean, they, they were desperate to, to surrender because it was getting on tonight, and it was freezing cold, and it was raining, and I don't think any of them had eaten in some time. And uh, they were uh, afraid that if they stayed out on the battlefield, somebody might mistake them for uh, something, people worthy of killing. Uh, so they, uh, they asked to surrender to us, and uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't want to do it. I mean, we, were, we tried to tell them we were not in that line of work, that we were. They sort of, uh, only one of them spoke English, and it was very little bit, but it was clear. And we s fumbled our way, uh, I think, in a, at least for myself, in a state of mild embarrassment through this um, 
exchange where we, we were like people trying to beg off of a dinner party invitation. We, we didn't want any part of it. We just wanted to... We gave them a lot of our food uh, and uh, orange juice and things like that. Uh, but we didn't want to take prisoners because it seemed uh, it, it wasn't our role. I mean, we were not in, in the prisoner taking business. Uh, so we pushed on and went on a little further, but were turned back by a, a minefield that had not been cleared. Um, we would, uh, I, I bought, uh, we bought in Kuwait City before we set out uh, 15 j big jerry cans. Uh, at the hardware store or uh, something like that and filled them up with gasoline and carried, um, we carried them with us in the back of the uh, thing at all times. Um, so you know, anywhere between 10 and 15 jerry cans filled up with gas. Um, turned back because it was getting dark and if the minefield wasn't cleared we were not going to try to get across it and, at dark with, uh, by guesswork and uh, came back and saw the uh, Poor guys still trudging along in the rain, and it was just too miserable to leave them there. So um, we took them not as prisoners, but more as taxi drivers. I mean, we we were not. Uh, this was not an act of of uh, subjugation on our part. We were merely escorting them, uh, and they climbed on top of the car and in the car and so on. And we got them a little farther on. And to give them to the first army unit which we we ran across, which was a Saudi brigade, a supply brigade that had not seen any action, and uh, they went uh, bananas over the prospect of, of capturing the enemy and um, went around jamming clips into their rifles and yelling and so on and terrifying the Kuwaitis who thought that they were all going to be shot uh, in the sand and so the Kuwaiti, uh, I mean the Iraqis, so the Iraqis are crying and carrying on and, you know, praying and the Saudis are yelling and Dan and I are standing there bemused at the side uh, and uh, not knowing, I suppose I didn't know what to, uh, to do. Uh, but it, it devolved fairly quickly into something that was, again, sort of not like what you think of a surrender in a time of war. The Saudis had no real interest in hurting the Iraqis. There, there was always among the Arab troops a, a sense of kinship with the Iraqis, a sense that they were, after all, Islam and Arabic and that they should not be killed. The Egyptian army, for instance, went to, I think, considerable pains from what I saw to avoid killing Iraqis. Um, they would not, uh, they, were, they would wait and let people come to them and surrender rather than take a building by storm and so on. Yes, at the very end, uh, which, uh, I, I suppose was a signal to all of us that nothing bad was going to happen. Uh, the uh, the Saudis calmed, Saudi soldiers calmed down a bit, and as they calmed down, the Iraqis started to calm down, and one of them went up. And there was one Iraqi who was sort of weeping and clutching at himself, and he gave him a kiss, I think, on each cheek, and then everybody sort of relaxed. I went to Kuwait not too long. We The next morning, we went back to that highway, and uh, the minefield had had been cleared in the early morning uh, by, I suppose, American and perhaps Egyptian troops, and there was a path through it. And that was the last minefield between us and Kuwait City, so we were able to get to Kuwait City by about noon of that day uh, and uh, get past a few checkpoints and into uh, the city itself. I spent a, about two or three weeks, I think, uh, in Kuwait and in the environs around Kuwait, up to the Iraqi border and so on. and up the highways where the Iraqi army had retreated uh, and had been, uh, if you remember, the roads where they were blown up and so on in retreat. Uh, about two weeks. Um, there was in Kuwait uh, a fairly, fairly quickly um, uh, enough in the way of communications that you could dictate uh, things. Two or three news organizations at least, no more than that, probably six or seven, brought in satellite phones. All the networks had one. And the Boston Globe, uh, for whom I was stringing, had a uh, half share in a satellite phone with uh, Time magazine, I think, uh, and I think maybe one other news organization. So you could 
get a satellite phone out in the evening. There, you couldn't get, a, there wasn't enough time to have uh, long conversations about a lot of stuff, but I think uh, most of the reporting that was done in Kuwait City uh, was, I mean, to some degree self-evident. You come into a city where, that has been occupied by an army and is now liberated, and the, you know, you, there are, you're, you're going to cover two things, one, the story of the liberation, and two, the story of what it had been like under occupation. Uh, so every day you just go out and do a different facet of that story. I think probably the, uh, I wrote a piece uh, just before I left Kuwait City about the Emir's new palace for the new republic that uh, to the effect that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was involved in the business of refurbishing uh, along extremely swank lines uh, a palace for the Emir who was coming home to Kuwait after sitting out the war in luxury digs uh, elsewhere. Uh, and, you know, the, the spectacle of the Army Corps of Engineers supervising workers doing things like putting fresh silk up on the walls and installing new go gold faucets for the bathrooms in a city where people were still without food or water or so on, uh, I think got a lot of attention. No, I don't think they did. I don't think they ever would have. Um, I think that uh, the smuggling uh, links, which have now been amply d proven between Jordan and Iraq, uh, would have always kept enough going uh, that the country could not be forced into, into compliance with the United Nations will by sanctions alone. Mostly because the people who run Iraq, Saddam Hussein and his, uh, his fellow Ba'ath Party uh, leaders and military leaders and so on, they run a, a gangster state, and which they control absolutely. And the notion that the sanctions might cause tremendous suffering to the people of Iraq, which they did and indeed still do, is not, I don't think, a tremendous concern. Uh, the people who run Iraq, the men who want run Iraq, still eat quite well and drink quite well and have mistresses and very nice Mercedes that they took from Kuwait and so on, and their life is not that painful. Um, it's... Uh, it's a fun job right now. This is, an, I suppose, uh, one of the best of all times to be watching a new administration since this administration is trying to do so much so quickly. There's a, there is a sense every day, I think for most people in, in uh, our line of work in Washington, that you're here at a time where there is an awful lot of substantive change about to happen or in the midst of happening, and that, that, is, that is thrilling. No, I don't uh, have any great sense of it. I don't really, I suppose, look for any great sense of it. I'm still in a process of learning about them. I don't really, uh, I mean, I, they are a work in progress. Uh, I, don't, I try not to form any uh, final conclusions about them or anybody else I cover on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I don't know. Uh, my mother doesn't, uh, not at all, or my wife, so. I don't, I don't think too much now. It was great fun. We grew up on Capitol Hill, and uh, my parents ran a, uh, I suppose, a kind of typical newspaper family house, and there were always people over for dinner, and um, there was always lots of uh, commotion at the dinner table and lots of people arguing about the events of the day and uh, a lot of uh, excitement in the air. I, I grew up... Um, uh, watching uh, grown-ups uh, argue around the dinner table at great length about things that they were not particularly well informed on, which is excellent training for a life in Washington. My mom uh, is also a writer. She writes about child care uh, for a, the Washington Post and other newspapers. She has a syndicated column and writes books on child care also. Uh, her, the Family Almanac, uh, Marguerite Kelly. And uh, she wrote, uh, she writes uh, books called The Mother's Almanac and Mother's Almanac too. I would be uh, happy if they said that the writing was good. I, I wanted to write something that was not, uh, uh, not a journalistic account as much as it was uh, a piece of writing. I wanted to write something that would use writing to look at the way war affects what happens in times of war, not the Gulf War, but war in general and the way people are and the way they behave. I'd be very happy about that. Thanks for having me.